good evening everyone so while you are working on your mba applications the first step of uh, you know putting up a strong application is getting the right gmat or the gre score and how do you prepare for the gmat or the gre you have a lot of material that you can tune into and there is one more asset you know that is uh, very valuable is uh, the people who have actually been through this journey so we have with us today anirban uh, and he is uh, we'll just uh, share his journey also very briefly so he is an uh, admit to iim ahmedabad uh, pgpx so he is headed to iim ahmedabad pgpx and he applied to the one year mba programs so anirban let us uh, you know first have your introduction and tell us about your career journey as well as the challenges that you faced in the gmat and the gre preparation sure sure and incidentally you have written both the gmat and the gre so we have lots yeah, of yeah, things yeah. to learn from you yeah so um yeah so i uh, i'm a computer science graduate i graduated in 2018 with a btech in cs and right after that i started a i started my own company in the iot and ml uh, domain with uh, three of my friends over the next 4 to 5 years i grew that on next 3 to 4 years approximately i grew that to uh, around 30 35 plus employees across two cities i raised around a million dollars in funding expanded the company created some wealth for my early investors after that uh, i worked in the sustainability domain for a while uh, helping scale up a company that uh, catered to clients interested in sustainability in the in the us and the eu and um, right now like uh, shruti has just said i am headed for ima in uh, approximately 14 days and uh, uh, i spent the last 6 to 7 months working in a non profit where i helped build it up from scratch and developed a user base that can be user base of uh, highly influential individuals who can uh, effectively contribute some charitable capital to small grassroots level non profits which really need it so and yes i have given both the gmat and the gre very uh, not not by design honestly um i gave the gg mat around 2 uh, years ago that was when uh, i was trying to figure out what the next step would be when i was kind of nearing the idea of exiting my my company uh, in the first place and uh, i got a i'm i got i'm not a, a good person for quant i got a pretty terrible score in quant but i did manage to get a somewhere between the 96 uh, to 99 in uh, i can't remember the exact number but somewhere around that in verbal so i realized that was my asset and i also realized that gre lets you focus on uh, verbal uh, just because it's it's more of a uh, it's more of a holistic application there uh, it's also got easier quants so i decided to focus on gre i scored a similar percentage there but my quant score also went up so that's uh, ultimately what i ended up applying with so yeah that's kind of a little bit about me in a nutshell yeah mm, that's great and uh, since you've written both the tests you know how much of uh, an overlap is there in the preparation um so there is definitely an overlap especially in um, in verbal Uh, but only for two sections. It's only for uh, let's say CR and RC that there's an overlap, because uh, GI focuses very heavily on on vocabulary, and uh, that's not something that GMAT has any doesn't really have any exercises on. So uh, over here, uh, I would say that if you have, I would say that going to the GMAT after the GRE would be a significant challenge. i would say if you've already if you're trying to get the gre done and you're not getting a good score don't believe that you will do much better than gmat the reverse might work because gmat um, gmat quant is significantly more difficult than gre is so going from that to gre is comparatively easier quant will increase your scores a bit yeah that's interesting and uh, you know while uh, there are so many sections on the uh, gmat and the gre So today we have you here to discuss your tips and strategies. What worked for you for uh, the reading comprehension section? So are we ready to take it up? Any initial uh, yeah, yeah. notes that sure. you would like to share? Absolutely, yeah. So, so I'll, I'll just now. make it. Yeah, I'll keep it a keep it a very short session. Uh, I just want to share a few things which helped me. Um, one of those things is um, something that might not be a lot of people's cup of tea. uh but it it's helped me a lot so i'll just give a brief introduction over it so for an rc question you are usually getting a topical paragraph that's either short or long 
and there's anywhere between three to five questions accompanying it. Uh, the question types generally revolve around a set few templates. So there's an inference question. There's a question that asks you to think about the main idea or uh, the primary purpose of the author, the issue that uh, is uh, inherent in the passage. And what is the we'll ask you for logical parallels as well, that if the author is thinking along these lines, uh, if I give you another situation, what might the author think about that? So that's the general structure that would be followed. So this is what I will do. This is just my two cents for uh, for something like this. So reading the passage well is very, very important. I am a big proponent of uh, reading the passage before even looking at the questions. There's a lot of sources which will tell you to uh, maybe pre-think. You look at a question, you pre-think, and then you go back to the passage, uh, find the answer. I don't think that works. Spend the bulk of your time, the lion's share of the, the time, maybe 80% almost, on uh, reading the passage very well. I'll talk in a short while about how you can read it to kind of retain uh, things better. And um, spend 20% of the time answering. Your goal is to be, become so well conversant in that passage that you can answer the questions immediately and very easily. Uh, in GRE, you have to, you will get to, it's only the sections that are adaptive, so you can flip between questions. So over there, my uh, opinion is keep the longest uh, RCs for the end because uh, you don't have any penalties if you score, uh, if you don't get, uh, if you don't finish the set of RC questions, right? So keep it for the end so you can relax, uh, breathe, read the passage and then go on to solving them. In GMAT, uh, whenever you come to an RC, just hyper-focus. That's the only thing I can say. Like if you can get an RC done, then you're getting four to five questions in in uh, continuous, in, like just one after the other, uh, four to five continuous questions solved immediately. You're getting marks for solving hard level questions back to back, and you're sort of mar getting marks for uh, keeping your accuracy up. So hyper focus on those. Um, the author's voice and tone are paramount. Uh, in during an RC, you will uh, very often be tempted to summarize the thing according to your knowledge according to your mindset for example if you're someone who works in the works in finance and you get a passage on finance and you come across very familiar topics immediately your brain is going to try and fill in the gaps with um, with whatever you know about those topics so the author might be saying xyz but you might read x and then go to a, a and b simply because you think that oh i already know about this so why would i uh, have to read this with as much care and attention uh, and so the author's voice is the only thing that matters your voice matters in a lot of other places this is not one of them uh, extremes are never okay in answers um, this is perhaps the most uh, useful hack you can use because there will be a lot of questions where you struggle to choose between between options and one of the ways you can differentiate is if one if one option is suggesting something way more extreme than the other so it can be uh if it, if there's if you see superlatives if you see very large or drastically or uh very very difficult you know or impossible these are words that would suggest uh that this might not be the right answer and the last one is no lofs lofs is what i call like it's just leaps of faith um the reason I, I kind of high, uh, focus on them a lot is because what we like to do during, uh, sorry, what we like to do during uh, a lot of these questions is we try to, uh, we look at, we think about what the implication is between, let's say, the premises and the conclusion of the of the passage that's provided. And we tend to supply the missing parts, the missing bits from our own knowledge and experience. and. That's not the that, that's not going to work here because the uh, question setters know that they know what the what like a possible uh, gap uh, like full what a possible value of fulfilling that particular need gap might be and they will absolutely put an option that corresponds to that just to trap you. So uh, these are these are my pointers and all I did was like uh, for around a month and a half I would say I practiced two to three RCs a day. This is for a GRE, for GMAT, it was around, uh, so for GRE, it was a month, for GF, GMAT, it was, I think, a month, or a month and a half around, practice two to three RCs a day, and focus on getting your accuracy up in RC. Okay, so 
uh, I talked about how you can retain the information better. And the most important thing I can say over here, and this is going to sound weird, but be weird about it. So weird is memorable. Your goal is to read that passage and retain every little bit of information you can. And the way to do that is uh, by making sure that that passage becomes memorable while you're reading it. So I'll give you an example. Um, I have a little passage here. I won't read the full thing, but I will read just the first two lines. So let's read it normally first. You know, you're know, you in a rush, you're in an exam. You just want to read the passage and try to remember something, some vague context so that you can look at the questions for later, right? So, so at that point of time, I'd probably read it like, when we consider great painters of the past, the study of art and the study of illusion cannot always be separated. By illusion, I mean those contrivances of color, line, shape, and so forth that lead us to see marks on a flat surface as depicting three-dimensional objects in space. <coughs> I must emphasize that I'm not making a plea disguised or otherwise for the exercise of illusion tricks in painting today, although I am in fact rather critical of certain theories of non-representation art. But to argue over these theories would be to miss a point. Okay, I've read this and immediately, let's say the question is, what is in the context of the question, in the context of this passage, what is the meaning of certain theories of non-representation art? I'm not giving any options, but uh, just in general, what would the answer be? Now, the goal is always to not skip back to the passage if you can avoid it. Because as soon, even the, the two seconds that you lose by looking from the question to the passage is very important. So. If I haven't given you the passage at all anymore, and this is there, then what is the uh, then then if will you would you be able to answer it? I would such I would probably say that I I personally wouldn't be able to. The way I read it, I would struggle to figure out what this particular highlighted section even meant, what uh, what it could possibly represent. So we're going to try and read this another time, uh, but it's a, in a slightly different manner. So this is how I would do it. So I basically <coughs> say. When we consider great painters of the past, the study of art and the study of illusion cannot always be separated. By illusion, I mean those contrivances of color, line, shape, and so forth that leads us to see marks on a flat surface as depicting three-dimensional objects in space. So this would mean, so this means that when I'm thinking, when I'm talking about illusion, I'm basically talking about the changes or uh, intonational differences in colors, lines, lines, shape, and so forth that Will make you see will make you uh, look at a 2d object and make it seem like a 3d object make, basically make, let you see things where there aren't things i must emphasize that i'm not making a plea disguise or otherwise for the exercise of illusionist painting today although i am in fact so rather critical of certain theories of non-representational art so this means that if i i am i'm not trying to beg or entreat you to decide to put in um, a lot of metaphorical illusion illusionary uh, illusionary uh, objects or clauses or phrases into uh, into painting, but um, despite the fact that I am actually rather critical of certain theories of non-representation art, so as soon as I uh, so I'm saying despite that, obviously has to mean that uh, I don't I do think that on some level art must contain something metaphorical, something uh, little illusory, illusory, right? So just because of this, what's important over here uh, becomes that this is what non-representation art will represent. So I'm just going to pause here and tell you that just through this entire process, I have now figured out that certain theories of non-representation art, what it actually refers to is the idea or that um, art does not need to contain metaphors, art does not need to contain uh, illusions or tricks or anything uh, similar. So now I just because of the way I've changed my reading style, because of the number of times I have stopped reading through the paragraph, I have stopped, I have paraphrased, I've sent it back to myself, I focused on certain points, I now have an idea of what this highlighted point means. See, the only way, only thing I'm, I'm trying to tell you through this is that the more you try to like reading the passage, the more you try to make the passage uh, be read out to you, or or you can pretend that the passage is being read out to you by someone as a very interesting story. And at every point, you are genuinely interested. You're like, oh, wow, well, I mean those contrivances of color, line, shape, and so forth, uh, as depicting 3D objects in space. You, As soon as you read that, you're like, all right. So that's what the author is saying. You paraphrase it back to yourself. You 
trying to figure out whether or not this is a good enough uh, representation of what the author is saying, this stuff sticks to you. That makes life a lot simpler. So that's one thing. Now, author's perspective is much, much greater than your perspective. Uh, this is something I've touched on before, the author's uh, point of view and uh, what the author is trying to prove through the passage is way, is way more important than what you are trying to do. So you have to clearly distinguish between the author's ideas and yours, okay? And at every point in, the, uh, in this particular uh, passage, you have to constantly remind yourself that, remind yourself of what the author is trying to get through to it. So let's say that you're reading a passage where the author is talking about, let's say a financial aspect, right? So you read the first paragraph and just like I told you before this in the, in the previous slide, you are reading it in a way where you're enunciating on certain points, you're paraphrasing and saying those points back to yourself. But at the end of every paragraph, keep a track of what the author's tone and perspective till then is. Maybe at the end, till the end of the first paragraph, the author's perspective is simply um, financial securities today are much more complicated than it was than they were uh, 20 years ago. And then he goes on to talk about an example of the thing. And then he goes on to talk about how this is a better, this is good or bad. So at every point, at every paragraph, you reevaluate or augment what your idea was of what the author is trying to say. And the reason behind this is that the most common types of RC questions are main issue and primary purpose questions. They are going to ask you about what the author, what the author's main issue is in relating this particular passage. What is the main issue he's trying to convey? What is his primary purpose? Main issue is uh, simply, uh, you can think of it as a uh, short description of the entire passage. So for what I described, it could be uh, changes in financial securities. Primary purpose is a more in-depth description of the same thing. So that could become uh, maybe a change in uh, financial securities and its impact on today's economy, right? Inference as well, if you have an idea of what the author is trying to talk about, inference is effectively you staying maddeningly faithful to the author. So if you know exactly what the author is saying, paragraph by paragraph, it's very important that you that you keep reevaluating your opinion every single paragraph, then I think it's going to get a lot easier for you. It certainly did for me. So I have a few questions here. Sorry, sorry to sure. interrupt you. One oh, is uh, you mentioned, huh? One is you mentioned, uh, you know, in the previous slide that you should practice at least two to three RCs at uh, yeah, yeah. in a day. So is it at one go? And then what are the good sources where you get, you know, the uh, let's say the mm -hmm. RCs which are close to the actual questions that you might face on the exam? Is there anything like that? So yeah, I mean, it's yes. definitely at one go. I would always say concentrate uh, all the practice and all the efforts that you're, uh, all the uh, practice that you're doing within like, you know, an hour and a half or so. Um, and uh, always stick to the timing. The source is, there's only one source. It's all uh, GMAT club. GMAT club or GRE, uh, GRE, I think has a, uh, has a sister site of the, with a similar name and a similar uh, UI. So mm -hmm. I think GRE prep club, if I'm not wrong. So what you do is you go there, you sort by difficulty, you try to do two very difficult questions and one easy question. So when I say easy, I don't talk, I'm not, I'm not talking about 500 level questions. I'm talking about questions between the 650 to 700 level. So two questions, which are approximately, let's say, um, 700 plus levels and that's and gmat club will have these questions categorized by levels so two questions like that and one question which is between 650 and 700 levels do them at a stretch try to replicate what sort of stress you might face during the exam close your doors um just sit down put on you put on your phones without anything playing of course if you have to and do them at one go and uh, always remember that don't panic about the thing that the very first question, it will, you'll see that, you know, as soon as the timer starts running, you'll take, if it's a long passage, you'll take anywhere between three to four minutes to finish the passage. And that's okay. So if you see, go to the first question and you see it's four minutes, 30 seconds, don't panic. Because if you have read the passage well enough, then after the clock strikes four minutes, 30, 
the next question will only take you 30 seconds the question after that will take you 30 the question after that will take you anywhere between 30 and one minute your goal is to just finish that entire section in six to seven minutes total so yeah so that's it yeah and coming to the panic part that uh, could that you mentioned that i've you know actually spoken to a lot of applicants who come back after the test after writing the actual test so they were probably scoring a 700 or a 720 on the gmat yeah, yeah. and the moment they go in on the mock test and the moment yeah. they go in for the actual test they have a long rc as the first question on verbal and that's where the whole score tanks you know they'll come back with a 550 so what what uh, is that more of a fear that you have for the rc and then you kind of lose control over the whole preparation that you have or what are the things that one can do to avoid those uh, i mean for verbal i think um no panic is definitely a thing uh, panic starts i would say panic only really sets in at the very beginning and that too in a particular situation if and only if uh, you're not able to do the first few questions or if you think that you don't have a lot of confidence in the accuracy that you have shown in the first few questions. So my recommendation would simply be um, in the first first two to three questions, uh, spend a disproportionately large amount of time. It pays off. If you know that you're going to, you have an average of, let's say 1.5 minutes a question. I've forgotten what the exact average is. Let's say it's 1.5 minutes. Take your, take the shot and spend two minutes on the first two questions. Okay, you lose an extra minute. Uh, maybe you're not able to answer a question at the very end, but verbal is not going to criticize, not going to ostracize you for that. It's not going to penalize you for it. Right. Because, um, of, uh, I think what, uh, just because of how how often uh, because see quant is something where like uh, you can get a 51 out of 51 and it's, pro it's probably still going to be a 96 percentile because there's just too many people uh, who are very very good at it doing a lot of it verbal may a lot of people will just stop at a certain level and uh, you'll, you'll only very rarely have people who do let's say 95 percent of the questions so even if you're able to do, let's say, way less than that, even if you skip 10 questions, there's a very good chance you'll cross the 92%. Right? So I would say, I would say just, you know, just focus on that. Like uh, spend a disproportionately large amount of time for the first two questions, settle down, feel confident that uh, my first two questions are, have been answered correctly. And that's it. So uh, I'm not going to do this big one. I don't think we have the time for it. Um, what I will do is one second. Uh, this comparatively smaller one, and that's only I'm only doing it to kind of talk about one particular aspect over here. So uh, what I'm going to do is I'm not going to read out much of it, uh, or maybe I will read out uh, much of it. But I'll just go to the question. When you're whoever is watching this now or whoever is watching this later you can always pause this you can always read the question and then try to answer it and uh, you should be able to you should be able to get it but i'm just going to you know point out some one particular thing so 70th century philosopher john locke stated that as much as 99 percent of the value of any useful product can be attributed to the effects of labor for Locke's intellectual heirs it was only a short step to the labor theory of values formally it is held that 100 percent of the value of any product is generated by labor and that therefore the employer who appropriates any part of it is practicing theft. So Locke's intellectual is basically stated, basically went made up the labor theory of value and stated that almost 100% of the value of any product is attributable to the labor. So any employer who's taking profits out of by selling goods, uh, despite using labor in it is basically practicing theft. Okay. So all the human effort is required to produce goods for the consumer market effort is also invested in making capital goods which are used to facilitate the production of consumer goods okay so there's capital goods out there that are useful for making uh, smaller consumer goods in modern economies about one third of the total output of consumer goods is distributable to the use of capital goods so uh, one third of the total number of consumer goods that are made is made directly because of the capital goods that are there and approximately two-thirds of the income derived from this is paid out to workers. 
and the remaining third as owners of the to, to the owners of the capital goods so two thirds of the total amount of money received from selling consumer goods that are a result of capital goods is distributed to the workers and one third is given to the owners moreover part of this remaining third is received by workers who are shareholders pension beneficiaries and the like so there's also workers who own stakes in the company who have uh, pensions uh, responsible for which are uh, what the company is responsible for so they also get a part of it part of that one third the labor theory of wealth systematically disregards the productive contribution of capital goods of paying for which lock must bear part of the blame okay so basically uh the productive contribution of capital goods given that the labor theory of value effectively states that 100% of the value can be attributed just to uh, workers and instead of that this author is basically saying that uh, there's a chunk of it that comes from capital goods which have been invested in and built by other people uh, which is just glossed over by uh, lock and uh, lock has to bear part of the blame for this because Well, it was his theories that gave rise to the theory of value. Let's go to question. Uh, the author implies which of the following regarding the formulators of the labor theory of value. So, just because of the way I've read this, I have a general idea of what the uh, what the structure and what the point of the passage is. So, I can is it because of the following regarding the formulators of the labor theory of value? They came from a working class background. Can I say that? Nowhere in the passage was it mentioned that Locke uh, himself was from class background or his peers were from working class background. Uh, the trick over here is basically that they're trying to imply communism, bring up Marxist ideologies, talk about the fact that how the there's this, you know, there's a worker, there's a workers, and there's a bourgeoisie. So if you're someone who's uh, studied a lot of political science, then this might immediately jump out to you. But that's the trap. That's what you have to avoid. Nowhere in the passage is the fact that they belong to the working class mention they were talking about labor but they themselves could have been from any class these their views were too radical popular opinion right so at no point is anyone talking about what uh, the general public thought of their views right it's not mentioned anywhere so i can just think about that at least one of them was a close contemporary of him right so if that is the this i can probably make happen right there's a very good chance that this is the case uh, because uh, it's possible that um, since i've already said that uh, a lot of people who followed him basically right in intellectual layers followed him uh, are the ones that came came in and uh, took his to a different level standardized it codified right that's one thing so that's that's definitely possible the other option is that so that's the, also i'll just cut out these cross out these and i'll put a circle next to this one the next one is that they are fam- familiar with lots use on the reduction of the of products yes of course right because uh, they have to have been like if they weren't familiar with uh, anything over here Uh, with uh, Locke's views on the relationship between labor and the value of products, they couldn't have actually figured out anything, right? So this is definitely the case. Uh, then he is they underestimated the importance of consumer goods in the modern economy. No, the only thing they underestimated was capital goods. So A, B, and E are definitely out. My things are now C and D. So here is where uh, I'll just bring up the political point of. LOFs that I talked about, leap of faith. So, uh, what you should have noticed over here is that when I said that at least one of them was a close contemporary of Locke, I was going on my definition of what the word intellectual heirs might mean, right? Because in my mind, I have read the sentence and I will think that okay, intellectual heirs. Probably means that there was those that these people were contemporaries of Locke, right? Because they were on the same level, maybe maybe they were uh, doing the same things. But 
that is a leap of faith because my mind basically saw intellectual as which effectively mean people who have taken up his thoughts his uh, his way of thinking and i saw close contemporary which is close which is near to that concept but not quite because close contemporary simply means that people who are working along the along block at the same site at the same uh, time as block espousing the same concepts and same theories it doesn't necessarily mean that uh, they were that if you are a contemporary you of of a of an artist you have to espouse the same notions of the artist so two painters a and b can have existed during the renaissance and a and b can could be contemporaries they could be operating in the same space they could be having a very similar artistic styles but they don't have absolutely zero inspiration from each other maybe they hate each other right so since the definitions are close my brain almost told me you know it's like this answer but now when i look back on it and i know that i made a leap of faith that this isn't immediately and utterly obvious from the text that they were indeed working at the same time i know it can't be this and therefore it's because he is your interpretations and and not yours so that's about it um but i think i just wanted to cover like these two aspects these three aspects only so it was basically this uh, give a small summary over here summary yes it's like it's a fun story being told to you do not be about the time right take four minutes take five minutes if you want remember like rcs are very scoring if you can read it properly you can answer four to five questions at a go and rack up marks like that so read the passage as as much as you can but sound it out to yourself uh, paraphrase it uh, keep a track of the authors in tone and uh, perspective on every in on every paragraph and modify it as we go down the line um, avoid extreme answers if answers have words like like uh, just drastically or immediately or impossible that's probably not the case and never make leaps somewhere never make leaps somewhere. always stick to the passage the passage is your cost so, that's it mm-hmm. that's great and thank you so much for taking out the time and sharing sure. the things so we we you know go to classes we learn so much from the trainers but it's always a pleasure to see and uh, we learn more from how fellow students have actually uh, you know uh, done those questions and what are the tricks that they bring out or what are the insights that they have to share so guys we have more uh, people coming in they will be coming in for the cr and for the quant section as well and thank you anirban so much uh, for the sure. time that you have taken out today and uh, yeah, it was a pleasure discussing this with you and all right, the best for your journey going forward all right thank you so much all right have a great thank day bye bye bye